Last week, we talked about King David. King David is mentioned more times than anybody in the Bible except Yeshua. Yeshua is mentioned about 980 times. King David's mentioned 900 times. Abraham doesn't even come close. Jacob doesn't even come close. Paul doesn't even come close. He's a major, major, major player. And he's the only man in, in the history of the human kingdom that is called a man after God's own heart. Now, there's two ways to understand that. One is David resembles my heart, but that's not, that's not the Hebraic understanding. When God says that you're a man after his own heart, that means you won his affection. You stole his heart. Wouldn't you like to steal God's heart? I mean, if you love God like I think you do, and I don't know because I don't, I don't know you. I don't know the motivations of your heart, in other words. Nobody does. But if you're a person who really, really loves the Lord, don't you want to be the guy that he says in heaven, that guy, he stole my heart. So what, what I had to understand, because the Holy Spirit asked me, is, son, how could a guy who, who performs such treachery, he, he's, he's peeking out his window, he's looking at this, this, this woman, he's attracted to it, it's kind of like a, a, a predated pornography, if you will. I don't think he was staring at her just one time. And so he, he decides, I got to have her. And he sends for her. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. So he panics because he's the king. He can't have this. There's laws for the king in Deuteronomy 17. There's specific laws for the kings in Israel. It doesn't apply to us, but it applies to kings. It's a big no-no. He panics. He brings back his general who just happens to be a righteous man. He picked the wrong guy. And he says to his general, look. You know, you're doing so well, Uriah, that I want you to enjoy the company of your wife. I'm bringing you off the battlefield. Enjoy, and then I'll send you back home. Of course, he would sleep with her. He's been on the battlefield. He's going to sleep with her. And then he's the dad, right? David's off the hook. Uriah sleeps outside. Some of David's other generals says he's sleeping outside. David goes, what are you doing? He goes, there's no way I can have any pleasure while my men are fighting. I will, I will, I will su- submit to you. In, ma- in other words, he didn't want to come off the battlefield, but he submitted to the king. If David said, stand on your head, he'd stand on his head. So he's going to go, he, I, I, I submit to you, my king, but I cannot. Too much of a disrespect to my men. I'm a warrior. Okay, when the war's over, I'll go home and be with my wife. David panics. So what does he do? He tells his other general, Send them to the front lines and back away. Let the Ammonites take them out. You, you, t- if you read this in the paper, you'd be pretty angry, right? right? So how does this guy go from that guy to being called a man after God's own heart? Now you'll say, Rabbi, but that's 1 Samuel 13. He's called the man after his heart. No, sweet pea, that's Acts 13. So the Lord was asking me this because obviously David had some attributes. That made him a man after God's own heart. And I found five that stand out. And I want to tell you, like, like David took five stones from the river to, ha- to, to perform victory in the name of the Lord, these are five attributes that you'll bring from the river of living waters to have victory in the Lord. They're, they're not going to surprise you. It's not going to be like, wow, I, I didn't realize that one. But I'm here to tell you that if you... Try to aspire to these five attributes. You just might win God's heart. Sound good? So let's talk about them, okay? Let's first look at some scriptures. 1 Samuel 13. Remember, it says, Shmuel, that's Samuel, the hero of God, said to Shaul, Saul, you did a foolish thing. And this was just the beginning of his foolish things. I mean, the end of it was when he pulled up Samuel from the dead through the witch at Endor. But, but this is his first big foolish thing, and that was he started to offer sacrifices. He wasn't waiting for Samuel to show up. He was impatient, and he took the role of a priest, and he was a king. You've got to know your role. You did a foolish thing. You didn't observe the mitzvah, the commandments of the Lord, which he gave you. If you had, Adonai would have set up your kingdom over Israel forever. He ruled for 40 years. But as it is, your kingship will not be established forever. It will not be your line. 
Adonai has sought for himself a man after his own heart. Okay? Looking at Acts 13, 21, 22, you're going to see the same thing basically. Okay? This is, he's in Antioch. He goes up in, which is Monday, Turkey. This is Paul who is preaching. It's his first missionary journey, his first stop. And he says, as he's talking about Israel's history, because where is he? He's at the synagogue. Why do you go to the synagogue? To the Jew first. Has that stopped? No. Nope. Nope. <laughs> then they asked for a king. He's talking about Israel's history. And you can read more of this if you read all of Acts 13. God gave them Shaul ben Kish, son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin, from Benjamin. After 40 years, I told you, 40 years he was the king. God removed him and raised up David as a king for them, making his approval known with these words. I have found David ben Yeshai, David, son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart. Now, don't miss the semicolon. What does it say? Guys, it is not good enough to say you have faith in God. It is not good enough to say I love God. It is not good enough. Some people say they love God. I'm here to tell you they think they love God. It is one thing to have faith in God, but can he have faith in you? Faith in God means that if you really have, let me handle this. If you really have faith in God, okay, if you really have faith in God, then when God tells you to do something, you'll do it, which means he could depend on you. If you say, I trust the Lord, then if you trust him, if you truly trust somebody, whatever they tell you to do, you'd follow. If you have a mentor, if you have a doctor, if you have a teacher, a parent, if you trust that individual, when they give you some guidance, you will follow. Yes? So it's very important. If you want to be a man after God's own heart, the way you get God's affection, the way you steal his heart, because God's saying, we need to do something. He's sitting up there with Michael, and he's sitting up there with Gabriel, the messenger angel, the head warrior angel. Over. He's saying, I need a job. And I could see Michael going, get David. He'll do it. He's crazy. He'll do it. He'll do whatever you say. That's what God loves. I promise you that's what he loves. He doesn't love your tzitzits. He doesn't love your kashrut. That's the least of things. He wants to depend on you. There's plenty of people that eat kashrut and wear tzitzits and do nothing except eat kashrut and wear tzitzits. There's plenty of people that go to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study and never help the poor, the widow, and the orphan. What's the good of knowing the Bible if you don't do the Bible? Faith without works is what? Dead. It's hyper grace. It's crap. God doesn't need us. He didn't need us to create the world, did he? Six days, look what he did. Pretty good job, right? He allows us to work with him. We are just the tools that he allows us. It's an honor. It's a, it's a privilege. He doesn't need us. But if you love the Lord, don't you want to be in his toolbox and don't you want him to go and go, I think I'll use so-and-so. They're totally dependable. Now, the tool never says to the building, look what I made. It's the builder. The screwdriver doesn't say, hey, look what I did. The hammer doesn't say, nice job, right? You're just a tool. Some need to take that a different way. But nevertheless, you're just a tool, man. Don't give yourself credit. You don't have much to do with it. When God tells you to go somewhere, if you don't get the directive, how are you going to go? And when you get there, if you don't get the anointing, how are you going to speak? Don't you realize you're nothing without the Lord? It's not good enough to say, apart from him, I could do nothing. It's a bumper sticker, man. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. But in him, man, and it's so good because you know why? When you respond and you do it, how do you feel? It's glorious, right? And if God loves you like I think he does, you know how he wants you to feel? He wants you to feel good. So you're not going to feel good if you don't do nothing. Does this make sense? This is, this is like a five-year-old can understand this, right? Okay. Thank you, Bern. I appreciate that. Number one attribute. 
number one attribute, bar none, David had great faith. You might focus on that bad chapter in his life, but you need to survey his life from 1 Samuel 16 to 1 Kings 2. Trust me, if you read it and you study it, you'll be blown away by this man's faith. Hebrews 11.6, look what it says. Impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. He loves faith. Not silly faith. Not, you know, the person has no job. They have no education. They have no resume. And they sign up for the Israel trip. Happens every year. The Lord's going to provide. No, no, sweet pea, you got to get a job. <laughs> you really do. You have to have some practicality. Okay? And I doubt somebody's going to come to your house, knock on your door and say, Hey, would you like a job? Every now and then something like that happens, but you've got to put yourself out there. God helps those who help themselves. You've got to put yourself out there and knock on doors, right? Doesn't he say, if you ask, this is Yeshua. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock, so you've got to ask, seek, and knock, right? You've got to do that. But it's impossible to please God without faith. This is the honor roll of faith, you know, Hebrews 11. God loves faith, loves it. No amount of good works can compensate for lack of faith. You can work for God, work for God, work for God, but if you really don't trust him, he'll know. Faith is the only thing that gives God his rightful place and puts us in our place. Because it says, I need you. Faith glorifies God exceedingly. It says, I trust you, Lord, but I don't trust me. When Moses asked, who shall I say? He said, I am. And you're not. That's faith. When you don't trust yourself. Hebrews 11.32. Whoa. Look, it says, what more shall I say? There's the honor roll of faith. Mentions Abraham. Mentions Moses. It mentions Noah. Mentions Jacob. It says, what more should I say? There isn't time to tell about Gideon, Barach, Shimshon, Samson, Yiftach, Jephthah in your Bible. David. He's mentioned. How did he get on that list? But see, the scripture says, what more shall I say? There isn't time. I have time. I'm going to talk about David. 1 Samuel 17, 32, 33, 36, 37. Four verses. David said to Shaul, no one should lose heart because of him. Who's him? You know from 1 Samuel 17. It's the story of Goliath. You've got to be able to know your Bible so you can navigate. You've got to be able to know. So you might not know every verse. But if somebody brings up Goliath and you want to look it up, you go, that's 1 Samuel 17. Do you know how you get to know that? <laughs> yeah, there's no magic to it. No one should lose heart. People say, why, you know the Bible pretty well. Yeah, because, you know, I read it. It's not like yeah, it's on my, you know, it's not like it's, I had to read it. David said to, well, you have to read it. You're a rabbi. I know, I read it way before I was a rabbi. In fact, I used to read it more because I had less to do. Very true. She'll tell you. David said to Shaul, no one should lose heart because of him, the Philistine, Goliath. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Shaul said to David, you can't go to fight this Philistine. You're just a boy. He was a ruddy young boy. 14, 15, who knows? Just a boy. This guy's been a warrior from his youth. Your servant has defeated both lions and bears. Now, this is where people think, oh, it's David. He knows how to defeat lions and bears, so he can take on the, no, that wasn't, that was, you'll miss the whole story. See, most people think that David defeated Goliath through the Lord. The story is God defeated Goliath through David. God gets the glory, not David. Your servant has defeated both lions and bears. He's just trying to get him to let him go because he respects the king. He's not going to go unless the king lets him. If the king says, I'm not letting you go, he can't go. Do you understand? That was back in the day where people actually respected authority. Now it's, what a bunch of rebellion. And you know, some of your kids are rebellious. That's because you are. They're only following suit. Ring, ring. So-and-so's on the phone. Tell him I'm not here. And then you look at your kid now later and say, don't lie to me. (laughs) 
God's not going to be mocked, guys. You're not going to mess with God. He's not going to be mocked. Your servant has defeated both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has, see, he didn't challenge David. He didn't challenge Saul. He challenged the armies of the living God. David took it personally. Then David said, Adonai, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the paw of this Philistine. So what does Shaul say? Look, I got nobody else. Fine. Go. Get out of here. Go. Adonai be with you. He had no, there's no shot he thought he was going to defeat the Goliath. No way. The whole army was petrified. But David was fully aware at this point in his life that God was totally in control of his life. And he was convinced, faith, that God would deliver him. He smelled the fragrance before he saw the flower. He was convinced. And David's weapon of choice was an AK, an RPG. His weapon of choice was God. God. Our, our fight isn't carnal. And our enemy doesn't have a social security number. And of course, he won. You wonder why Saul just would not leave David alone? He just kept coming after him and coming after him and coming after him. You know why? One word. Jealousy. And jealousy runs rampant in the human kingdom. And jealousy is one of the fathers of all sins. Pride first. Then when you're so prideful, you get jealous. And then when you're jealous, you talk. And when you talk, you gossip and you're done. And that's the way it goes. Pride gives birth to jealousy. Jealousy to gossip. And you're done. I'm not hearing from God. Yeah, why, why would you? <laughs> why would you? God's not going to be mocked. You've got to play according to his rules, guys. You've got to. You've got to do it the way he says to do it. Otherwise, you're not going to get the benefit. You're not going to get the blessing. You're not going to get the connection. You're not going to get the fellowship. You're not going to get the intimacy. It just doesn't work any other way. He's God. Make no mistake. And he knows it. And he has no problem with it. Even when they bowed before Yeshua, he didn't say, get up. He says, you're doing the right thing. Look at this next section. Talking about David's faith. When Shaul returned, we're reading from 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 11. When Shaul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he's having a war with the Philistines, the army of God, Israel. He was told that David was in the desert in En Gedi. Um, we go to En Gedi every year. I'll be going there. I love it. In fact, there's a couple of caves there, and I always go in. Shaul took 3,000 men, 3,000 men chosen. These, these were his special forces, like Delta, like the Berets, like the SEALs. Not just any, the army, the standing army was hundreds of thousands of men in Judah. But he took a special task force with him. 3,000 chosen from all Israel and went searching for David and a few of his men. Can you imagine? 3,000 going to, if you've ever been to En Gedi, it's a small place. There's just a couple of caves. And Shaul went inside to relieve himself. He was near some sheep pens along where the cave was. He got to the cliffs where the goats were. You'll see the goats of En Gedi, actually. That's what it's named after, the goats of En Gedi. And he goes into, you know, he's got to urinate. It's not like there's a porta potty. The, the historic porta potty was the cave. That was the cave. And so he, he went in to, to urinate, to relieve himself. It happened that David and his men were sitting in the recesses of the cave. You know, his cave is dark, mostly he doesn't see. Can you imagine that? Here this guy keeps trying to kill him. And he, David and his men are in the back of the cave. So what do they say? Look, praise the Lord, hallelujah. The day has come that Adonai told you about. He told you about this, David. That I will turn your enemy over to you and you will do to him whatever seems good to you. He said, take him out. Let's take him out. Then David stole over unobserved and cut off the corner of Shaul's cloak. Let's continue. But after doing this, David felt remorse over cutting Shaul's garment. Can you imagine? He said to his men, quote, Adonai forbid that I should do such a thing to my Lord. Adonai is anointed. As raise my hand up against him. Guys, you can learn a message from this. Trust me, some of you need this bad. There are two pillars in God's kingdom. One is authority and one is submission to that authority. 
And the Bible is very clear. If you can't submit to those you do see, you cannot submit to those you don't see. So what God is saying in Scripture is if you're not willing to submit to people in authority, you're not submitting to God, whether you, whether you like it or not. You're not. That's a, that's a real slap of truth, isn't it? You've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with it, and it's all about changing. After all, he's God's anointed. I'm not raising my hand against him. By saying this, David stopped his men and women and would not let them do anything to Shaul. Stand down. Shaul got up and left the cave and went on his way. Then David too got up and went outside the cave where he called after Shaul. My lord, the king. Shaul turns. When Shaul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the, bowed with his face to the ground. Not taunting him. Hey, dude, I could have killed you. Lighten up, or next time I'm going to take you out. That's what we say. He bowed with his face to the ground in respect for the king. Prostrated himself. David said, this is a guy looking to kill him, and he's not going to stop. David said to Shaul, why do you listen to people who say David is out to harm you? Why do you listen to people, guys? Why do you listen to people? Don't you know that people are liars? All men are liars. Go to the source, Matthew 18. Stop gossiping for God's sakes. God's going to take you out. Go to the source. Find out from the source. Why are you listening to what people are saying? That David is out to harm you. A couple more verses. Here today you have seen with your own eyes that Adonai put you in my power in the cave. Some of my men said I should kill you, but I spared you. I said I won't raise my hand against my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, look, he calls him my father, Lord, King, my father, my spiritual dad. Here in my hand you see the corner of your cloak. By the very fact that I cut off a piece of your coat and didn't kill you, you can see and understand I have no plan to do you harm or rebel. Wasn't rebellious totally submitted that's a man of great faith and that I haven't sinned against you even though you are seeking every chance to take my life the king of Israel has come on a campaign after whom look at how humble he is who are you chasing I'm a dead dog there's nothing worse in Israel than me called a dog except a dead dog that's the lowest of low and then if he didn't, Saul knew exactly what he was saying. And then he says, I'm a single flea. What do you want with me, king? I'm, I'm not going to hurt you. But you know what? Saul kills his thousands. David kills his ten thousands. Why can't you just be happy with what God gives you and the mission he gives you? Why do you keep competing, Christian? You've competed in work in your life. You competed in sports. Now you're competing in the kingdom? There's no unity in that, brother. I mean, if God sends you to India, hallelujah. What are you so jealous about? And if you're that jealous, go. There's planes that still fly there. It's sick, and it's demonic. Just demonic. David spares Saul's life in Engedi. That's a town in the wilderness of Judah. It's on the western shore of the Dead Sea. We go every year. David knew, listen, remember when his men said, God has given you, like he said. God never said that. But David knew. They were lying to him. God, give him over to you. Uh uh uh-uh. uh David knew of no command from God to take the kingdom by force. He was faithful, and he was waiting on God's timing. Samuel said, the kingdom is going to be in your hands. He was waiting. He was trusting. He had faith. He could have took it by force. If the guy was out to kill me, let me tell you, and he came in the cave, I'd lop his head off. No questions asked. That's me, and I take the kingdom. David was a man of great faith. He was patient. And you know what? God has taught me patience. Even when people have come against me, I don't don't fight them. I will not fight them. I will not sling mud. I let the Lord is my defense. I let him work it out. And guess what? He's worked it out. Every, I've been here 15 years. This is the land of division. And in 15 years, God has slayed the giant in my life. Every time, bar none. 
And I never had to lift a finger. Never had to lift a finger. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's why you want to know why I'm so crazy about God? That's why I'm so crazy about God. David would respect the king until God, the king of all kings, removed him. Again, he's not going to give up. I mean, he says to him, you know what? If you keep reading the story, you know what Saul says? He prophesies, you are a righteous man, David. More righteous than I'll ever be. The kingdom is yours. At least he could prophesy. Look at what happens next. We're just on the fact that faith is the greatest attribute you can have to win God's heart. 1 Samuel 26, 1, 2, 5, 7 through 12. The people from Ziph went to Shaul and Givna. That's where Shaul lived. And said his hometown. David is hiding on the Hachilah hill across from Yeshimon. I'll get to where that is in a minute. Then Shaul set out and went down to the Ziph desert with 3,000 men. There he is again. His boys chosen from Israel to search for David. I mean, he took your cloak. Why don't you believe him? Paranoid. Paranoid. David set out and went to where Shaul had pitched his camp. Can you imagine this? He went to his camp, man. Now, (laughs) Saul's not hunting David. David's hunting Saul. He saw where Shaul and Abner, Abner is his chief bodyguard, his head general. The son of Ner, the commander of his army, was sleeping. God put him in a sleep. You ne- when, you, when the king is sleeping and you're guarding him, you don't fall asleep. You do not fall asleep. They were sleeping. Can God do that? Is there anything God can't do, guys? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Shaul was laying inside the barricade with the troops asleep all around them. Man, you want to talk about easy pickings? So David and Avishai, that was one of his generals, went to the soldiers by night. Just two of them. Two guys. 3,000. Shaul was lying there asleep inside the barricade. Let me, let me give you some math. You plus God equals a majority. His spear was stuck in the ground next to him. With Abner and his troops sleeping all around. Look at what happens next. Avishai says to David, God has handed your enemy. Here we go again. He's, he's right there, man. He's right at your foot. His spear is right next to him. So now please... Now, the, let me just tell you something about David's mighty men. They were a whole nother level. These guys fought all their life, and they trained all their life. They were like the 300 toughest guys. Listen what he says. I love the toughness in this guy, Abishai. He says, so now please let me pin him to the ground with one stroke of the spear. I won't need a second stroke. I'll put it right through his heart. He'll be done. One shot. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him, exclamation point. No one can raise his hand against Adonai. What a leader. Look at what he's teaching his men without becoming guilty. David then added, as Adonai lives, Adonai will strike him down. Faith. Or the day will come for him to die. Either way. Or he will go down to battle and be swept away. God will do it his way. Frank Sinatra had it all wrong. Adonai forbid that I should raise my hand against Adonai's anointed. But now we'll take the spear by his head and the jug of water and get out of here. So David took the spear and the water jug from Shaul's head and got away. Nobody saw or knew about it. No one awoke because they were all asleep. A deep sleep from Adonai had fallen over them. God put the sleep on them. And then if you read on this story, again, he says, I got your spear, dude. When is this going to stop? And then I love, keep re- you got to read the Bible, man. You're missing the greatest book ever. He taunts Abner. He goes, what kind of commander are you? I take your head if you ever fell asleep when you were guarding me. And Abner's like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> King Saul spared by David once again. This is just south of Hebron. And even though David was constantly on the run from threat of death of King Saul, he would not touch God's anointed. He was winning God's heart, guys. He was, he was trusting God so much that he actually was dumb enough to believe that God can handle it. Not force his hand. We force, we, do, we want something so bad that we get so emotional and we make a soulish decision that we actually convince ourselves that it's the Lord. And what we think, what we think we're, do, we're, do, we're going with it, thinking we're following the Lord, but what we're really saying is, come on, follow me and bless me. Follow me. Guys, don't work like that. Not in God's economy. I'm just telling you. That's not the way it works. 
Now, last but not least on David's faith, 1 Samuel 27, 1. David said to himself, one day Shaul will sweep me away. The best thing for me to do is to escape into the territory of the Philistines. Then Shaul will give up trying to find me here or there in Israel's territory, and at last I'll be free of him. Now, why did I bring this up? Because no matter how faithful you are, you're going to have crisis of faith. Now, some people, please don't take this wrong way, but you have crisis of faith every day. Every day you're doubting God. Every day you're doubting God's existence. Every day you're going, why me? Why me? It's not becoming. David was a man of great faith, but I want to point out to you, he wasn't perfect. So I don't want you to try that route because it's going to be very frustrating. But look, look, look at it. Even people go, well, Rabbi, Job lost it. Yeah, look how long it took him to lose it. How are you doing? You break a nail, you get a flat tire and you lose it. He lost all his children. He lost his health. He lost his wife's support. And then he lost it. Not bad, right? I mean, you know, not too many people after they lose their children could say the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Here you find David. He's fled from Gibeah. He's fled from Nob. He's fled from Gath. He's fled from Adullam. He's fled from Moab. He's fled from the forest at Hereth. He's fled from the wilderness, well, the wilderness at Ziph. He's fled from the caves at Engedi. He's, he's worn out. Anybody ever get worn out? Yeah, half of you are worn out right now. Like, Rabbi, stop talking. I will stop talking if you start listening. I'm telling you the way to not be worn out. You should not be retired. You should be refired. So he's over it. The pressure of constantly running from place to place, constantly being attacked. He's done. He keeps running one step ahead of death, and he's, he's weary, and he's at a weak point, right? Don't make decisions when you're at a weak point. Not good. I have a question. Would God appoint King David, king of Israel, only to allow him to be killed before he could reign? Doesn't make sense, right? Then God would be a liar, right? Would God deliver David from the hand of Goliath only to deliver him in the hand of Saul? But what do we know? We know that circumstances has a way or a tendency to obscure the promises of God. I'm here to tell you that truth trumps circumstances. Trust the Lord. If he gave you a promise, you hold on to it no matter what your dang circumstances say. Because God is true and every man is a liar. Faith, number one attribute. Faith, trusting God. But not just saying trusting God, trusting God in such a way that if he tells you something to do, you'll do it. You'll be the man. Number two, and I'm only going to probably get to two, and we'll get to three maybe next week. David absolutely, positively loved God's word. Loved God's word. David's known as the sweet singer of Israel in Jewish circles. He penned 73 of the Psalms. That's almost half of all the Psalms. One in particular I think worth mentioning is not only the longest Psalm, but it's the longest chapter in the whole Bible, Psalm 119. Psalm 119, hold on if you go back for a sec. Thanks, kid. Psalm 119 should be entitled All About the Bible. If I was going to title the song, All About the Bible. It's also called the golden alphabet of the Bible in Jewish circles. Reason being, the psalm is divided in 22 sections. You know that, right? Some of you might know that. And there's eight verses to each section, which gives you 176 verses. The reason why it's broken down into 22 sections is because each section has, starts with the letter of the alphabet in the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters. So in the first section, it would be called Aleph, and every line of those eight lines would start with Aleph, every sentence. Bet, and so on and so forth, Okay. It's, it's amazing, it's just amazing to me how much the word is spoken about. Listen to the different words used in Psalm 119 to describe God's word. Law, testimonies, ways, precepts, statutes, commandments, ordinances, words, promises, judgments, faithfulness, appointments, justice, and commands, all pertaining to God's word. By using the alphabet in 119 in this acrostic form with the 22 letters, you can see how I think the writer is trying to say human language is exhausted when we try to speak of the greatness of God. No words can explain it. 
Let me show you some, some verses from Psalm 119. 119 verses 47 to 48. It says, how I delight in your commands, exclamation point. It's not, I, I delight in your commands. I delight in your commands. How I love them. I honor and love your commands. I meditate on your decrees. David didn't just read the word. He loved the word. A lot of us read the word. Well, a lot of us don't even read the word. There's no question about that today. Most believers don't read the word. But some of us read the word, but it's not good enough. I'll explain, and I think you'll get the message. He loved the word. He meditated it day and night. He communed with it. He pondered it. You know what he would do? He would get lost in the word. He would sit with the word, and somebody would say, man, you've been sitting there for five hours. Five hours, seven hours. You know when you love the word, you can get lost in it. You could, you could read one sentence and meditate and like time stands still. I've, I've sat sometimes, Bernadette will tell you, like five in the morning and then I'm like, it's two in the afternoon. It's nine hours and it felt like five minutes. And then I realized, man, I'm late. I'm late I, and I didn't have enough time. He loved it. It was like a fountain of delight for him. He couldn't explain it. Neither can I, but it's like a fountain of delight. It's like a river of pleasure. A never-failing source of joy. To him it was power and there was depth and there was treasure. Look at Psalm 119 verse 16. I, find, I will find my delight in your regulations. I will not forget your word. Whoever is born of God or born again in the Lord will delight themselves in the ways of God. They will love the commandments of God and they will determine. Whether they do it all the time is another issue. But at least you've got to make that determination. I delight, I love the word of God, and I'm determined to keep it. You've got to start your day like that. You can't start your day. Some people start the day, well, Lord, I'm going to mess up, so I'm just saying I'm sorry now. Wow. That's like telling your kid, don't, don't get in the block. You're a loser. Look at Psalm 119, 97. How I love your Torah. I meditated all, on all day. Listen to me. You'll know if you love the, wor- the Lord because you'll love his word. I have friends. They love golf. I got nothing against golf. It's not my thing per se, but I think it's a real quality game. But what do they do? They read Golf Digest. They watch golf on the weekends. They play during the week. They look for the latest putter. They go to the stores. What are they telling you? They love golf. It's okay if you say to them, you love golf. It's like, duh. If you love the Lord, you'd love his word. If you love the Lord, you'd make time to read it. I promise you. Some of you are single moms. I know you don't have the time I have. I get it. I get it. But if you really think about all the hours in the day and where you're spending them, you'll make a little time for the word. Even if it's on a weekend. Even if you've got to get a babysitter. Where are you going? You going out tonight? Girls not out? No, no, I'm going in. I'm going with the Lord. Imagine that. What are you getting a babysitter for? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere to be alone with the Lord. pretty cool stuff love will show itself by reading and reflecting on the bible at every opportunity in its moments of meditation you will discover new beauties and wonders in the scripture it happens all the time the other day i was reading it about david's life not this and i saw something that i'm going to share with you it blew me away it might not blow you away but it blew me away i was like man i've never seen this and i grabbed bernard at like 6 30 in the morning i was like "Bernard, i gotta share this with you she goes greg i gotta do washes i gotta get this kid to school i go no 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 you don't understand she's like greg seriously lighten up and i'm like you lighten up little freak i'm trying to share some revelation with you i told her I made her sit down. I don't care. I don't care. Throw the wash out the window. The kids, I don't even know what grade they're in. Let me give you this revelation. <laughs> I had to tell somebody. I was bursting at the seams. I broke it down, really. I had to tell somebody. When you get that revelation, don't you got to tell somebody? Let me tell you something very important. Listen to me. There are pastors out there that love for them to be the revelator. It happened in the first century. They put a chasm between clergy and laity they said i'm clergy remember they didn't start reading the bible to the 1500s because they didn't put it in the hands of the people i'm the opposite of that i don't want you to get revelation from me i am i am coaxing you pushing you no begging you 
to get the revelation direct from the source. If you get it from me, when you're sitting here, you're like, okay, that's deep, and you're going to forget what I said 20 minutes from now. But when you get it from him, you will never forget it. But I can't give that to you. You have to get it, man. Psalm 119, 127. Just a few verses, and we're out of here. I love your mitzvot more than gold. More than fine gold, precious gold, man. One index of how precious the Bible is to us is the amount of time we spend reading it. I can always tell right away how close somebody is with God. When I look at their Bible and it looks like it just came out of the box, they're not close. I don't care what they say. But when I look at it and the cover's worn and the page is afraid, it's a different story. They're turning the pages. Psalm 119, 164, look what this says. I praise you seven times a day because you're righteous ruling. Now, did he actually, oh, it's time. Did he have a little alarm? No, seven is number in gematria. It means spiritual perfection. What he's saying is constantly. That's what this Hebraic idiomatic term means. One can take the number. You can take it literally, but it's figurative. Trust me. Seven represents completion. David was saying, the Lord should be praised continually and wholeheartedly for all his laws are holy. And just and good. You say, Rabbi, that's Old Testament. No, that's Romans 7, 12, sweet pea. Don't ever forget this verse, 2 Timothy 3, 16. I gave it to you in the New Living Translation because I really wanted you to see it. In my Bible, it says all Scripture, and that's all. By the way, in the Greek, in the Hebrew, in tongues, all is all. All Scripture is God-breathed and is valuable for teaching the truth convicting of sin, correcting faults, and training in right living. Guys, look at what this says in the New Living Translation. And I don't mind the New Living Translation because it's a translation. It's not a paraphrase, and they have good Greek and Hebrew scholarship. All Scripture is inspired by God, all, and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. You're doing this with your kids all day long. Don't you want God to do this with you? You do this with your kids all day long, right from wrong, and correct them when they go off and bring them back on the path. You want them to know the truth so they're not hoodwinked and beguiled, right? So why don't you read the Word so you can know it? You can't just read the Bible. You've got to study it. It won't work. It's literally God-breathed. That means it's God's very words to us. Man, there are so many philosophical questions that have been asked. What is the purpose of life? Is there life after death? Is there heaven? How do I get to heaven? Why do I struggle doing good? Those are the big questions. What about the small questions? What do I look for in a mate? How can I have a successful marriage? How can I be a good parent? How can I handle bad events in life victoriously? The Bible has the answers for all of it. All of it. We should read and study the Bible because it's unique among other holy books. You've got the Book of Mormon. You've got the New World Translation. You've got the I Ching, the Bhagavad Vedas. You've got the Talmud. Listen to me. You can check hundreds of details of prophecy in the Bible. Hundreds. And you could check the historical accounts. When it talks history, there's history all over the Bible. The history books agree with them. That's called external evidence. You can check scientific facts as it relates to the Bible. It has internal evidence, external evidence, and bibliographical evidence, second and none. I've done the study. You need to do it. I'm not going to convince you. I'm not going to spoon feed you. You need to know. You can't just say, well, it's God's word. No, it's better than that. It has incredible literary authenticity like no other book. And those who say the Bible has errors are close to the truth. The Bible is timeless. It's just as relevant for us today as when it was written. But there's nothing new under the sun, so says Solomon. People will forever look for love and satisfaction in all the wrong places. But we know man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you want to live life to the fullest, you must listen to and heed God's word. Trust me, I was Mr. Secular. I was Mr. Rebellion. I went to the best parties. I had the best clothes. I had the sports cars. You know what I think? It's dung compared to knowing my father.
Reading the Bible also helps us recognize all the false teaching that's so rampant today. You have to know what's true in order to recognize what's counterfeit. I told you in the 70s, they were passing counterfeit bills like crazy. So they put all bank tellers in America under a very extensive six-month course. They knew every minutia about the bill. If you don't know what's counterfeit, you will never know the truth. Look at Joshua 1.8 and James 1.25. Two different guys, but with the same mentality. Joshua, God says to him, yes, keep this book of the Torah on your lips and meditate on it day and night so that you will take care to act according to everything written in it. Then your undertakings will prosper and you will succeed. Who was his mentor? Not a bad mentor. He did pretty good, huh? Do you see any, do you see any weak points in Joshua's life? Because he was diligent to study that book and heed it. Then you got James, who, who most hyper-grace people can't stand James. Why? His letter is 108 verses, 54 of them commands. Nobody wants commands. I'm free. Listen, knucklehead, you're free from the enemy ruining your life, but you're a slave to Yeshua. You're not free from Yeshua. You're not free to do what you want. You're a slave. See, everybody wants a Savior. Nobody wants a Lord. Saviors are fun. When you're drowning, they pull you out. But when you get out of the water, you better bow at the feet and say, you're my Lord. It's a whole different ballgame. Look at what James says. But if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah... The Torah is perfect? Yeah, we're the problem, not the Torah. <laughs> Last time I checked, God's word was holy, just, and, and good. Which gives freedom. Freedom to do what? To obey. Freedom from the enemy ruining your life. Freedom from being in pain and sorrow and suffering from bad emotional decisions. That's the freedom. Not free to do whatever you want. You're bought with a price. Your own, baby. God's property. Get it through your head. Gives freedom and continues becoming not a forgetful hearer. But a doer, what's the good of hearing? Rabbi, I read the Bible. Okay, I read the Bible. Okay, I read the Bible. Okay. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. Huh, huh. <laughs> you got to be a doer, guys. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I could, I could not. I could not make it. I would have lost my mind. If I was Mr. Jew from New York coming here to teach a bunch of Gentiles Hebraic stuff, I told God, if this is where you want me to start, that's fine. But if I don't get out, if, I don't have, if we don't do some schools, orphanages, help some people, then, then for what, Lord? I'm teaching them and they're getting he Jewish stuff, and then what? Then what do we do with it? We hang around and, and praise the Lord because we got Jewish stuff. Guys, it's not going to work. It's not good enough, man. Faith without works is dead. That's what James says. Faith without works is dead. Look at Psalm 119, 911. We're almost there. You making it? You all right? You sure? Okay. Just, just, just make believe. You. Just start going like this, and, you, and you'll be fine. I mean, you haven't done it for like two hours. You're probably freaking out, right? Your thumbs are like, oh, my God. I, I got to send a text. Got to send a text. Got to look at my Facebook page. You'll get there. Relax. Psalm 119, 911, it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I treasure your word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. Thy word have I hidden in my mouth so I won't sin against you. Look at Matthew 7, 24, 27. Look, this is, this is the Lord speaking. He gave one sermon, one, one, one sermon, one, only one. Parable is not a sermon. One sermon. A parable is a little drive-by. It's a spiritual drive-by. Okay? You just throw a little, cast a little seed. But he has one sermon, one, sermon on the mount, one, only one, one. And this is at the end of it. This is how he concludes his one sermon. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, say acts. Yes. And we're not talking about the book after the Gospels. We're talking about doing it, guys. Doing it. For God's sakes, please do something. Stop living for yourself, man. You wonder why you're so stressed? Because you're just living for yourself. It's stressful. God's going to bless you with times of refreshing. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on bedrock. The rain fell. The river's flooded. The rain's going to come. The floods are going to come. If you think, oh, if I just get over this hurdle, right? If I just get this job, if I just find this girl, if I just get this guy, man, it's never going to stop. That's life. In this world, you'll have tribulation. It rains on the just and the unjust. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Black, white, it doesn't matter. The rain fell. The river's flooded. The winds blew and beat against that house, but it didn't collapse. Hallelujah. Because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a stupid man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, 
The rivers flooded, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it collapsed. And its collapse was horrible. It was so horrific. Reading and obeying the Bible prevents us from wasting years of our life on things that don't matter and won't last. Some people spend more time on their stupid lawn than in the Word of God. The lawn's going to outlive you. It is not enough to hear the Word. We must listen and try to obey it. If a person lives his life according to the principles found in the Sermon on the Mount, the world calls him a fool. But Yeshua calls him a wise man. The world considers a wise man one who lives by sight, who lives for himself. You know, people always say when sometimes I'll ask somebody, hey, how's so-and-so doing? You know, my old neighborhood. And they go, oh, 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 so-and-so? He's doing good for himself. And I think, exactly. He's doing good for himself. When people say you're doing good for yourself, that's not a compliment. I read that millennials, you know millennials? Millennials. I have like three. <laughs> Generation Y, they're born from 1980 to 2000. They're, they're, they're popular and they're big and they're getting themselves out there because, you know, they know how social media works and they're always out there. This is what they want out of life. Three things. They only want three things, which isn't bad. That, that makes it simple. They want experience. They want travel. And they want food. Now, I like experience. I do. I love encounters. And I do like to travel, especially when it's to India and Africa. And I like food. I do. But let me show you my take on experience, travel, and food. First Timothy 6, 18, 18, 19 is my take on experience. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. I like to experience true life, and this is the way I do it. There's no greater feeling. Guys, I'm telling you, I've been, you name it, you name the place, and I've been high there. But I'm telling you, there's no high like the most high. And when you go in a village and people come and you realize that if we didn't send them money, they'd starve to death, does it puff you up a little bit? It may, but I'm telling you, it makes you feel so good. It makes you feel so good. Good, I can't describe it. Let me tell you my feeling about travel. Psalm 37, 34. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. And last but not least, food. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Experience can be a great teacher when it comes to certain aspects of life, like medicine. By the way, I have good friends that are doctors. Two of my best friends are doctors. I never understand why they say, well, I've been in practice 36 years. When are you going to get it right? But experience is not a good teacher when it comes to sin. It's the worst teacher. When it comes to sin, our greatest teacher is wisdom. And the Bible is chock full of it. Isn't it great to learn from biblical characters like David? Isn't it beautiful that we have the Bible? In his defeat of Goliath, we learn that God is greater than anything we have to face. And in his fall to Bathsheba, we learn just how awful and long-lasting the consequences of a moment's pleasure can be. I always tell my kids, don't give up what you want most for what you want at the moment. They'll ruin you forever. The Bible is a book not just for reading. It has to be studied and applied. Once you understand something, you gain knowledge. Once you apply that knowledge, you have wisdom. If one just reads the Bible without studying it, it's like swallowing food without chewing it and then spitting it back up again. You'll get no nutritional value. And if you just read the Bible without breaking it down, you'll get no spiritual value. It is imperative that you study the Word if you want to understand God's heart, and if you truly want to be a man after his heart. It is good to hear revelations I told you from others, but listen, it, it's like the difference between the actual and the virtual. The next time you're hungry, bite out, bite, take a bite out of a virtual hamburger. Tell me if that satisfies. <laughs> Noah Webster, anybody familiar with him? I use the dictionary every day in my life. No kidding. Probably 10, 15 times a day. There's words sometimes that I just don't know what they mean, and I want to understand what I'm reading. So I'm I'm hitting the dictionary all the time. I thank God for Noah Webster. He published his first dictionary in 1806. You know why I thank God for him? It took him 26 years of working 10, 12 hours a day. 26 years. The next time you look at a dictionary, appreciate that. He had to learn 28 languages for etymological purposes. That's the origin of the word. Listen to the languages he was versed in. Old English, Gothic, German, Greek, Latin, Italian, Spanish, French, Dutch, Welsh, Russian, Hebrew, Aramaic, Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit. 
I know, we can't even speak English. <laughs> Look at what he said, his quote. Education is useless without the Bible. The Bible is America's basic textbook in all fields. God's word contained in the Bible has furnished all necessary rules to direct our conduct. I think he knew what he was talking about. Last but not least, guys, reading and studying the Bible is like mining for gold. If we make little efforts and just sift through the pebbles in the stream, we'll only find some gold dust. Some people are happy with gold dust. It's better than nothing. But if we really dig into it, and I mean really dig into it, we find nuggets that last a lifetime. Listen, guys, dig. There's gold in them hills. Dig. Don't miss out on what God's given you. So many people, millions and millions of people have died just because they wouldn't disrespect the Bible. Take advantage of it. We got faith. He, he was a man of faith. He was a man who loved God's word. We're going to talk about three more attributes next week. I don't know. We might finish next week. We might not finish this week. Ah, it's up to him, not up to me. Okay? You ever see people when they're like, oh, my God, i got to make two more points, but I'm running out of time. And they go, blah, blah, blah. How can you disrespect a revelation front like that? You know what I mean? We're on God's time. So we're done for now. So uh, let's stand up for a minute. Shalom.